I'm telling you, I am so grateful to all of those who have participated. But first, let me say who I am. I'm Joanne Gavin, the director of the Furious Flower Poetry Center. And I want to certainly recognize the members of the Furious Flower Advisory Board who are here. I think we have two members here. Uh, Mer Winger, where are you? There you are. And I know, I know that she's here because she has presented her, her flowers. So Carter Douglas, are you in the house? She was just in the house. She's coming back. So uh, we want to thank her. Over this week, we have witnessed the unveiling of a masterpiece. The body of work of Yusef Kamenyaka. And because of his generous and humble spirit, we have come to know a man who is wise, conjuring, complex, and sometimes enigmatic. We are grateful for the sponsors who have allowed us to get to have this week. I was delighted to see David Beringer of the Virginia Foundation for Humanities come in. David, stand up. <laughs> the Virginia Foundation for Humanities has been our most um, constant sponsor over the last 22 years. And I am so grateful for all the people over there. Thank you for being here. Also, the Poetry Foundation, a major sponsor. <laughs> and here at JNU, the College of Arts and Letters, the uh, Department of Foreign Languages and Literatures, and also a group called 4VA. We are really, really thankful for all of our sponsors. Let's give them a <laughs> now, About this wonderful man who has been the subject of our gaze all week. Born in 1947 in Bogalusa, Louisiana, Yusef Kamanyaka is the son of the South. He served in the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War, <coughs> an experience that infused his creative career. Since writing his first poem in 1975, Kamenyaka has been published in over 20 books, <coughs> including 14 collections of poetry. He has been awarded many major prizes including the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 1994, the Kingsley Tuff Award, the William Faulkner Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award, two creative writing fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Furious Flower Lifetime Achievement Award. As an F yes. <laughs> As an educator himself, Kumayaki has influenced a generation of young poets and scholars. And many of them are sitting right in this room. Yusef Kumayaki has taught at several institutions, among them Princeton University. And now he is Distinguished Senior Poet at New York University's Creative Writing Program. He has also served as a faculty member at Kaveh Kanem, the Kowloon Workshops, 
and Key West Literary Seminars, among others. The Furious Flower Legacy Seminar takes its title from Kamenyaka's most famous work, Facing It. Emblematic of Kamenyaka's style, the poem is known for its musicality, muscularity, and fine attention to craft. He produces a poetics of witness, of clear-sighted, unflinching seeing that compels us to locate ourselves silently in the moment of the poem. Whether it details the ordinary movements of daily life, recenters the other world of mythology, or recounts the experiences of combat. In Seeing and Reseeing, also published in 2005, special issue of Kowloon, poet Toy Derricott writes of Kamenyaka's work. The most permanent thing about the voice is the language it leaves behind. Images so real, they are like ripe fruit in the mouth. Images in Kamenyaka's work transcend the visual. The rhythms of jazz have been critical to the production of his poems. In an interview, he says, I do think that my creative psyche has been tooled by music, especially the blues and progressive jazz. I think of early blues voices, Robert Johnson, Big Mama Thornton, Bessie Smith, Muddy Waters, Sunhouse, and Nina Simone. This becomes a psychological measurement of time. For the poet, the music one is immersed in can influence the natural music of the poem. The influence of jazz on the poet and its manifestation in its poetry have been documented by many critics. And I must say, many of the critics who are here, including Michael Collins, Ed Pavlik, Angela Salas, Maida Dewar Jones, Hermine Penson, all of these people here, all of our faculty members, please stand up. <laughs> giving us this awesome experience.
Yes. <laughs> this week has been much, hasn't it? Um, I would like to say that um, I'm taken with all of you. Um, thanks to Fierce Flower, Joanne, Karen, Lauren, all the participants. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate this. It's an honor. I was thinking um, earlier that a month ago, I actually on May 21st, um, I was standing at, at a different podium in a different situation. I was in Bucharest um, receiving an award and I felt very lonely, okay? Um, I feel at home. I'm just going to try and go across the map a little bit. Uh, I won't say that I'm going to actually surprise myself, but I'll try. When eyes are on me, I'm a scrappy old line who's wandered into a Christian square, quavering with centuries of forged bells. The cobblestones make my feet ache. I walk big shoulder, my head raised proudly. I smell the blood of a king. The citizens can see only a minotaur and a maze. I know more than the lion should know. My roar goes back to the Serengeti, to when a savannah was craggy ice. But now it frightens on the pigeons from a city stoop. They believe they know my brain's contours and grammar. Don't ask me how I know the signs engraved on the sundial, the secret icons behind a gaze. I wish their crimes hadn't followed me here. I can hear their applause in the dusty citadel. I know what it took to master the serpent and will, the crossbow and spinal tap. Once, I was a leopard beside a stone gate. I am a riddle to be unraveled. I am not, and I am. When their eyes are on me, I become whatever is judged badly. I circle the park. Hunger shapes my keen sense of smell. A lifetime I had. They will follow my paw prints till they're lost in snow at dust. If I walk in circles, I hide from my shadow. They plot stars to know where to find me. I am a prodigal bird perched on the peak of a god house. I have a message for fate. The sunlight has shown me the guns and their beautiful sons are deadly. Blue Dementia. In the days when a man could hold a swarm of words inside his belly, nestled against his spleen sinking. In the days of night riders, when life tongue to read till blues and sorrow song called out of the deep night, another man done gone, another man done gone. In the days when one could lose oneself, all up inside love that way and then moan on the bone till the gods cried out in someone's sleep. Today, already, 
I've seen three dark-skinned men discussing the weather with demons and angels, gazing up at the clouds, and squinting down into iron grates along the fire streets of luminous encounters. I double-check my reflection in plate glass and wonder, am I passing another Lucky Thomason, a Marin Brown, cornered by a blue dementia? Another dark-skinned man who woke up dreaming one morning and then walked out of himself dreaming? Did this one dare to step on a crack and a sidewalk? to turn the midnight corner and never come back whole? Or did he try to stare down a look that shoved a blade into his heart? I mean, I also know something about night riders and cat gut. Yeah, honey, I know something about talking with ghosts. <laughs> I'm going to read um, the very last poem I've written. Uh, it is the first poem in um, a new and collected poem entitled Everyday Mojo Songs of the Earth. Don't, tell, don't ask me where the title comes from. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the first poem in that in progress collection. Say lick cleaned at birth, say weeping in the tall grass. Well, let me tell you the title. Did I tell you the title? No. Okay. The title is A World of Daughters. Okay. A World of Daughters. Say lick cleaned at birth, Say weeping in the tall grass where this tantalizing song begins. Sparrows perch on a crooked branch over a grave of an unending trek into the valley of cooling waters. Lessons of earth, all questions cluster inside, says the oracle counting seasons and centuries, undoing fault lines between one generation and next. As she twirls sackcloth edge with pollen, and one glimpses what one did not know, say this is where the goat was asked to speak legends ago to kneel and discover and deliver a sacrifice. To feel a truth depends on how and why the singer's song fits into the mouth. Example, I believe the borrowed rib story is the other way round, entangled in decree, blessing, law and myth one only has to listen to night-long pleas of a mother who used all thousand chants and prayers of clay, red ochre, blown from the mouth into the high stone wall, recalling land bridges to wishbone my own two daughters and granddaughter, the three know how to work praise and lament, ready to sprout wings of naked flight and labor, yes, hinge into earth. We rose from Lucy to clan, from clan to tribe, and today we worship her son polished bones, remembering her name is birth and death. No, 
Mama is not always the first word before counting eggs in the cowbird's nest. It begins here again. Now say her name, mother of us all. Hmm. Um, I was asked by Penn to write a prayer. That was a couple of years ago. And um, I'm going to read a prayer for workers. Bless the woman, man, and child who under earth by opening shine in the soil, displayed hour between dampness and dust to plant a few seedlings and furrows and then pray for cooling rain, bless the fields that catch the hunt and the wild fruit and let no one go hungry tonight or tomorrow. Let the winds and birds see a future ferret into villages and towns, the other side of mountains, along nameless rivers. Bless those born with hands made to work, hewn timbers and stone raised from earth and shape in circles who know the geometry of corners and bless and please leaven the foundation and pitch of roof so good work isn't diminished by rain. Bless the farmer with clouds in his head who lugs bags, baskets of dung so termites can carve their hives that whole water long after a downpour has gone across the desert and seeds sprout into a contiguous greening. Bless the iridescent beetle working to hold the heavens down to journey from moon dust to excrement. The wedge slaves two steps from Dickens' tenements among a den of thieves, blind soothsayers who know rambles where migrants, where migrants feathered the nests of straw bosses as the stone cutters perfect profiles of robber barons and granite and marble and town squares along highways paved for Hollywood. Bless souls laboring in sweatshops and each calabash dipper of water, the major and minor litanies and gangla dangling from promises at the mouth of the cave, the catcher of vipers at dawn, and the cane break and flowering fields, not for the love of money, but for the bread and clabber on a thick gray slab table. For the simple blessings in a small town of the storyteller's drunk on grog, bless the cobbler, molin leather in his oaken lass, meeting softness and give in a red shoe and a work boot, never given more to one than the other, and also the weaver with closed eyes whose fingers play the ties and loops as if nothing else matters. They break the sunset as stories of a people grow 
into an epic stitched down through the ages, the outsider artist going from twine and hue, cut and tag, an iron monger's credo of steam rising from buckets and metal dust and the claim of a hammer against an anvil and the ragtag ones, the motley crew at the end of the line singing ballads and keeping time on a battered drum. I think we have to give praise where praise is due, right? Okay. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, okay. This is a different kind of rhythm. Um, it's called Blue Light Land Sutra for the Performance Parts at Harrow Park Hotel. The need gotta be so deep, words can answer simple questions all night long, notes stumble off the tongue and color the air indigo. So deep fragments of gut and flesh cling to the song. You gotta get into it so deep, salt crystallizes on eyelashes. The need gotta be so deep, you just can't. Let me start. You gotta get into it so deep, the salt crystallizes on eyelashes. The need gotta be so deep you just can't bump up ghosts and not feel broken. To you no more than a half ounce of gold and pain for brightness, you gotta get into it, blow that saxophone. So deep all the sex and dope in this world can't erase your need to howl against the sky. The need gotta be so deep you just can't wiggle your hips and rise up out of it, chaos in the cosmos, more than man in a pepper pot. You gotta get hooked into every hungry groove. So deep the bomb locked and rust. Opens like a fist into it, into it so deep rhythm is pre-memory. The need gotta be basic anima need to see and know the terror we are made of, honey. Cause if you wanna dance this boogie, be ready to let the devil use your head for a drum. Right. Okay. Okay. You know, I just like going across um, <laughs> different landscapes, and each landscape has a different music. Um, I'm going to read a few poems from my latest book, The Emperor of Water Clocks. Latitudes. If I am not Ulysses, I am his dear ruthless half-brother. Strap me to the mass so I may endure night sirens, singing my birth when water broke into a thousand blossoms in the landlocked town of the South. Before my name was heard in the womb-shaped world of deep, sumptuous waters, Storms ran my ship to the brink, and I wasn't myself in a kingdom of unnamed animals and totem trees, but never wished to unsay my vows. From the salt-crusted timbers, I could only raise a battering ram across where I learned God is rhythm spurs. If I am Ulysses, made of his words and deeds. I swim with sea cows and merrymaids and merrymaids in a lost season, ate oysters and poisoned berries to approach the idea of death tangled and the lifeline slack on that rolling barrel of a ship. But then come home to more than just the smell of apples, the heavy oars creaking 
the same music as our band. Turn this great tussle with water. I, I am just really amazed with, well, I'll let the poem speak for itself, okay? Uh -huh. Talking about light. It's just I'm amazed by Turner's um, expertise in dealing with light and, and painting. Turner's great tussle with water. As you can see, he first mastered light and shadow, faces moving between grass and stone, the beast wading to the ark, and then the decline, the decline of the Carthaginian Empire before capturing volcanic reds. But one day while walking in windy rain along the Thames, he felt he was descending a hemp ladder into the galley of a ship down in the swollen belly of the beast with a curse hooked in the bell and bucket and the whimper and howl and the piss and shit. He saw winds hurled, sailed at mass pole as the crewmen wrestled slaves dead and half dead into a darkened whirlpool. There it was, groaning. Then the water was stabbed and brushed till the luminous and the bloody sharks were on their way. But you're right, yes, there's still light crossing the divide, seeping around corners of the thick golden frame. Okay. Fortress. Now I begin with these two hands held before me as blessing and weapon, blackbirds in fierce flight and instruments of touch and consolation. This sign means stop, and this one, of course, means come forth, friend. I draw a circle in the red iron clay around my feet where no evil spirit dares to find me. One's hands held at this angle over a boy's head are a roof over a sanctuary. I am a green horn in my fortress in the woods with my right eye pressed to a knot hole. I can see a buzz in the persimmon tree, its white lead and gold, a tiny white cross and each seed. The girl's fiery jump rope strikes the ground. I see the back door of that house close to the slow creek where a drunken, angry man stumbles across the threshold every Friday. I see forgiveness, unbearable twilight, and these two big hands know too much about nailed and hammer, plank and uneasy sky, hewn, stoned and mortar is a, another world. And sometimes a tall gate comes first, then huge wood, wooden barrels of grain, flour, salt meat, and quick lime before 28 crossbows and four towers. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the next poem I like to read is um, a poem dedicated to Garrett Walcott. Um, I miss him greatly we find the poem okay islands an island is one great eye gazing out a beckoning lighthouse search like a wishbone compass, or kind of wake to the stars. When it comes to outlook and point of view, a figure stands on a rocky ledge peering out towards an archipelago of glass on the mainland, a seagull's wings touching the tip of a high wave out to where the brain may stumble. But when a mind clams down, from its long, craggy lookout, we know it is truly a stubborn thing and has to leaf through pages of dust and light, through pre-memory and folklore, remembering fires roared down there today, pushed up through the seafloor, and plumes of ash covered the dead, shaken awake, whirls away, and silence fills up with centuries of waiting. Sea urchin, turtle and crab came with earthly know-how, and one bird arrived with a sprig in his beak. Before everything clouded with cries, a millennium of small deaths now topsoil and seasons of blossoms in a single seed. Light edged along salt-crusted stones across a cataract of blue water and lost sailors' parrots spoke of sirens, the last words of men buried at sea. Someone could stand here, contemplating the future, leafing through tone pages of St. Augustine, of the prophecies by fishermen, translating spur and folly down to tap rut, the dreamy eyed boy still in the man the girl and the woman. A sunny forecast behind today, but tomorrow's beyond words. To behold a body of water is to know pig iron and mother wet. Whoever this figure is, he will soon return to dancing through the aroma of Dagger's log, ginger lily, Bolinvillia, between chance and strain struck till gourds rally the healing air. And the church steeple birds fly sweet darkness home. Whoever this friend or lover is, he intones redemptive harmonies. To lie down in remembrance is to know each of us as a prodigal son or daughter looking out beyond land and sky, the chemical and metaphysical beyond falling and turning water wheels and the colossal brain of damnable gods, a eureka held up to the sun's blinded eye, born to gaze and to fire. After conquering frontiers, the mind comes back to rest, stretching out over the white sand. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I was thinking about that. <laughs> Stay hydrated for the spirit, right? <laughs> so 
Sorry about that. Okay. O to the Oud. <coughs> I love instruments. <laughs> it's my favorite. O to the Oud. Gourd shaped muse, swollen with wind in the mulberry. Tell me everything you're made of. Little desert boat a raw. Uplone box of bedding doves, pecking pomegranate seeds out of the air. You have the poet's persona, his double, and the high priest's third chamber. Each strain a litany of stars over the Sahara. Pear-shaped traveler, strong but so light, is there a wishbone holding you together? I wish I knew how to open you up with an eagle's feather or a pick whittled from buffalo horn, singing alive the dust of Nubia. Rosewood season long ago, I wish I could close all 12 mouths with kisses. The tongues strung in a row. I wish I could open every sound in you. I envy one blessed to master himself by rocking you in his lonely arms. Little ship of sorrow, bend your voice till the names of heroes and courtesans, birds and animals, prayers and love songs swum for you, from your belly. Mm -hmm. Envoy to Palestine. I've come to this one grassy hill, Ramada, of Tokyo Street, to place a few red anemones and a sheaf of wheat on Darwish's grave. A barred line transported me beneath a Babylonian moon, and I found myself lucky to have the shadow of a coat as warm listening to a poet's song of Jerusalem. The hum of a red strain Caesar stole off Gilgamesh's lute. I know a prison of sunlight on the skin. The land I come from, they also dreamt before they arrive in towering ships battered by the hard Atlantic winds. Crows followed me from my home. A co my coyote heart is an old runagate red skin, a noble savage, still Lakota. And I knew the bow before the arch. I feel the wildflowers, all the grasses and insects singing to me. My sacred dead is the dust, the restless plains I come from, and I love when it gets into my eyes and mouth, telling me of the roads behind and ahead. I go back to broken treaties, the smallpox, the irony of Bob War. Your envoy could be a reprobate whose inheritance is no more than a swig of fire water. The sun made a temple of the bones of my tribe. I know a dried up riverbed and extinct animals live in your nightmares, sharp as sharp teeth from my mountains strung into a brave necklace around my neck. I hear Chief Standing Bear, 
saying to George Dundee, I am a man, and now I know why. I'd rather die a poet than a warrior, tattoo, and tomahawk. History. History is always with us. Timbuktu. I sang an elegy for the city of 333 saints. For every crumbling mosque and minaret, for the libraries standing for centuries against dust storms, for the nomads herding trees of life across the desert, along trails where camels hauled salt to rafts woven on the river Niger, before the empire of Sun Hefel. The griots speak of an epic memory of stardust and sand. But now mercenaries kidnap, run drugs, and kill in bold daylight. Blood money brought them into Libya, and more blood money took them home, brandishing stolen guns and grenades. When Lord Byron and Tones and Don Juan, where geography finds no one to oblige her, I hear my name. But no one stands up to prophecies the other side of limbo against the modern as a metallic eye drones overhead. Medieval clouds may promise safe passes or escape routes out of Mali, but the God-fearing cannot remember the faces of death at the kicking in all the drums. I realize I don't have a watch here. Mm -hmm. 7.50. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Plenty of time. Okay, plenty of time. <laughs> you know, I work on a number of collections sort of side by side, and they sort of influence each other. Um, I'm going to suggest read a few poems from those in progress college. <clears throat> the first, uh, I read a poem that I just written, um, um, A World of Daughters, and I realized that the poem that follows that poem is a poem entitled our side of the creek. Riva. We pile planks, sheets of tan, and sandbags across the creek, till the bright water rose and splayed both sides, swelling into our hoorah. Our hard work broke July thrashes and fat June buds <coughs> and decades of dead leaves. Water moccasins hid in holes at the brim of the clay bank as the creek ease up pevet bones, hips, navel, <coughs> and chest to eye lever. When the boys dove 
into our swim hole. We pumped our ball fists. The far up there, rebel yells. The Jim Crow birds sang of a simon in Mayhaw after a 12 gauge shotgun sound in the deep woods. If we ruled the day and hour, the boys were called girl cousins and sisters, and they came running half naked into a white splash, but we could outrun the sunset through sage and rabbit tobacco, born to hide each other's alibis beneath the drowned sky. Um, the other um, selection I'm working on is a um, group of poems called Night Animals. I suppose the whole process was actually to take me back to, to the night time um, that I that I cherish. I wasn't afraid of. Matter of fact, I'm writing a poem, Never Afraid of the Night. I'm just going to read a few of those poems. Night gigging. A three prom spear waits for a bullfrog, the same base from the reedy, the old porn. A silhouette lingers, cleave from the kneeling man back to hunger and simple philosophy of the fears. How dirt bades for a seed to work into a thick rut to pry up the foundation of a heavy wooden bridge. There's a ghost poise between free will and the gig, waiting for the song, the blink of an eye, in a gully of bloomy thorns. Martian light on tall grass guides the practice, the practice instrument whole, oh, now go. It calls with open vowels, looping through a froggy nighttime domain, a knot in the throat, and yeah, sanction up the bloated moon in a bag. Sever mysteries of the platypus. <laughs> Never mind. Sever, sever mysteries of the platypus. She tries to hide in a swish of wet grass because she remembers the first man like a wound, an old scar, a howl in the hush. Her skin is too rough for the marketplace. Otherwise, she would have fallen under a bullet or knife. She came from an old world, a prototype, the first Shemra. Peace. She came from an old world, a prototype, the first Kamara. Peace together by a prankish guard, that first moment of light seeping from the cave, an oath written on her back by the edge of a flood. Before she slipped from the egg, she knew a human face could make her heart explode into a clutch of stars. And 
And the last poem from this in progress collection, Nine Animals, is titled Another Kind of Light, or Another Kind of Night. Slowly, the remembered trees, a 900 year old sky, the call of birds, a mambo snake snoozing beside a stone, a mass tall as a man an hour after sunset, jackals holding a ceremony at the edge of a lake. It all fades into rancor. But my own face is still a boy's, losing its features down there where everything is one God-forsaken animal wounded in the nameless dark. All the faces are one consolation where the dead interrogate the living. The motion of the sea beneath, God of moonlight, God of sharks patrolling the schooner, and God of laughter on the deck. Hyenas on a hilltop, are you still trying to tell me something about mercy? In this other night, riding the trade winds, the, wet, the waves underneath a creaking eternity, we are nothing but cargo. Moans in the belly of a leviathan, wind toss, the, sail, the sails broken, toned down, the tatters beached up on white sand, stretching out against sky for centuries, seagulls calling to birth cries in the new world. Try this poem. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. to the maggot. <laughs> Brother of the blowfly, and God had you work magic over battlefields, slabs of bad pork, and flop houses. Yes, you go to the root of all things. You are sound and mathematical. Jesus Christ, you are merciless with the truth. Ontological and lustrous, you cast bells on beggars and kings. Behind the stone door, a Caesar's tomb, a spit trench and a field of ragweed. No decree, a creed, can outlaw you as you take every living thing apart, little master of earth. No one gets to heaven without going through you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Passionate voice. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's see. Okay. I'm not going to try and recite that off the top of my head, but I probably could. But I, I don't want to surprise myself in the wrong way. 
<laughs> okay, facing it. My black face fades, hiding inside the black granite. I said I wouldn't, damn it, no tears. I'm stone, I'm flesh. My clouded reflection eyes me like a bird of prey, the profile of night slanted against morning. I turn this way, the stone lets me go. I turn that way, I'm inside the Vietnam Veterans Memorial again, depending on the light to make a difference. I go down the 58,022 names, half expecting to find my own in letters like smoke. I'll touch the name Andrew Johnson. I see the booby trap's white flash, name shimmer on a woman's blouse, but when she walks away, the names stay on the wall. Breaststrokes flash, a red bird's wings cutting across my stair. The sky, a plane in the sky, a white vet's image floats closer to me, then his eyes look through mine. I'm a wonder. He's lost his right arm inside the storm. In the black mirror, a woman's trying to erase names. No, she's brushing a boy's hair.
school as well as college here. And uh, we have bonded in a <laughs> very <great>. special <laughs> way. We have poets here. We have poets as young as 19 and as old as, I don't know. <laughs> 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 I also uh, saw that Paul Summers came in. He is one of our board members, Paul Wayne. Yes. And all this week, I haven't really been able to say thank you to my biggest fan, and that is my husband. I see him back there. <laughs>